I'd like to thank uh, everybody for listening to me and for uh, uh, Charlie Rod, Jens, and Kojo for inviting me. It's been like 23 years. I think I showed up as a medical student, and uh, Rod was the PGY2, and Charlie was the intern, and nobody would have thought, you know, a quarter century later we'd be here, but I appreciate it. So this is a really complex area that um, I always treat with great respect. It's um, a uh, really more complex than any of the other segments of the spine, and it kind of links the cranial to the obviously to the cervical. That's our junction. Um, it's really highly dependent upon yeah the ligamentous complex there. And again, as you can see, it's a very complex ligamentous complex, which keeps the uh, the stability of that region more so than any of the bony anatomy. Um, Yesterday, we had a great surgical demonstration of the anatomy there. I encourage you in the uh, cervical station to uh, explore uh, the bony anatomy so you can have a uh, really good understanding of where you're starting. Uh, the navigation is great, uh, but I think as alluded to before, it can be off. So if you have no idea if your starting point correlates with uh, you know a good anatomical starting point, you won't know if you're off, and then you'll create a problem that you don't want to have. So I think uh, you know having the basic understanding of the anatomy and being able to put it in without the screw enhances your ability to use the navigation to put it in safely. So I'm also really reluctant to operate at this uh, site unless I absolutely have to. I know some people are more aggressive. There's a current sort of camp that. Treats a lot of patients with Elos Danlos and uh, um, some, uh, you know, other uh, sort of Chiari type symptoms, and they're very aggressive with their uh, uh, fusion. But as you can see here, this is a very important and unique uh, anatomy uh, that allows for a significant amount of motion. You can even see on the right side that the uh, motion is complex. And so when you take this away, um, it can really affect, especially in older patients that are swallowing, um, it can really affect uh, the motion and their quality of life. So you have to really think twice before you are aggressive at this level. Some of the indications that I use um, are, are here. Uh, rheumatological is generally probably the most common one you'll see as an elective or as something non-urgent, um, as well as congenital perhaps. Uh, trauma, I think, is one of the probably my main indication now, um, especially in elderly patients uh, who uh, sometimes, unfortunately, may need a, a treatment. But again, I'm very reluctant and very strict on my indications. Um, some of the techniques you'll go over in the lab, obviously, occipital plating um, is very key. I think uh, play around with the different plates that you have access to. Um, there's many different styles. Um, in general, I think uh, most of the faculty will tell you you want to try to get uh, by, uh, cortical screws uh, through uh, the uh, midline where the, or the keel where you have the most purchase, and that will allow you to have probably the most effective uh, long-term purchase uh, of those screws um, for the plate. Uh, we already, you had a great demonstration yesterday of the C1 screws. I encourage you to... Uh, 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 try that uh, in the lab. Um, it can be quite uh, easy in lab, but when you're in real life, it can actually be quite difficult. Um, you know, people can point to the starting point, but usually in real life, it's bleeding like crazy. And so you have to figure out ways to manage that and to be able to uh, visualize your starting point. And then obviously yesterday, a great uh, demonstration of the different types of C2 screws, uh, pedicle pars, and then obviously the laminar, uh, translaminar uh, bailout was discussed. Uh, you also have access now to very specific rods for this. Um, you know, you should make sure when you're approaching this to have access to one of these. This makes it a lot easier to uh, uh, find the correct alignment and also um, uh, place these rods. You have hinge rods and pre-curved rods. Uh, among different uh, options that you have out there. I think, you know, one of the things that we don't talk about, placing the screws is important, um, and then uh, placing the uh, uh, a right anatomy, a right alignment anatomically with the, uh, the rods is important, but 
Um, you know, how do we get the, the thing to heal? If you're doing it on a late 80s person, it may not be as essential, but if you're doing it on somebody younger, uh, these are very difficult to achieve arthrodesis across the junction. So you want to consider how you're doing this. Uh, maybe consider a structural implant. Uh, maybe consider uh, some adjuncts to your uh, uh, fusion matrix. Um, and I know that uh, my uh, senior partner, Roger, still uh, wires some of his graphs to the uh, to the. Uh, um, uh, either to the bone if it's left as C2 uh, or into uh, the uh, rod. So I just wanted to go over a couple cases. Um, this is an 85-year-old uh, lady, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, kind of everything that we normally see on the Upper East Side. Mechanical fall, um, was doing fine, but just had some neck pain and obviously had a, uh, a C2 injury. And so you can see here, this is what it looked like. Um, we got the CT of the C-spine, acute type 3, a dontoid fracture, normally considered to be um, relatively stable, extended into the transverse foramen uh, and right pars. There was already some anterior displacement. Uh, everything else was negative, um, but there was some possible disruption of the ligamentous complex as obtained on her MRI C-spine. Uh, no vascular injury, which is one thing we also look for. And so she uh, in, was in a hard collar initially, and we got an upright film. And you know we are very conservative where I'm at, and I I can tell you, you know, less than one time a year that I generally operate on odontoid fractures unless I absolutely have to. Um, and so we usually manage them safely in a collar. But in her case, that uh, that didn't really happen, and so she had a progressive worsening and uh, uh, change. So this again, you can see um, uh, the translation is worse and this is uh, set up for imminent neurological compromise. So again, the occipital cervical fusion uh, is, is had to be done uh, for stability and to maintain her quality of life. And you can see here, um, again, we uh, span the area of the fracture occipital plate and then uh, multiple uh, screw purchase below due to the fact that she had significant osteoporosis to get many points of purchase. Another case, uh, this is a little bit younger guy. This is a 72-year-old uh, pediatric cardiologist who had a fall at home and that was immediately uh, plegic uh, but was uh, uh, improved by the time he got to the ED with some motion, although uh, definitively weaker. And again, you can see here, this is uh, um, a long-term chronic uh, issue going on that he probably didn't know about. And then you have uh, all this degenerative change, compression of the spinal cord, and then the fall just was the feather that broke the camel's back. Unfortunately, you see here, he's got significant compression of the spinal cord um, as it exits the craniocervical junction. So this is somebody that will need uh, intervention. And so again, um, relatively uh, straightforward once you have all the right tools and the navigation that uh, Dr. Johnson discussed. Uh, if you have an anatomy understanding of the, uh, the uh, occiput, this becomes a relatively straightforward operation to place uh, all the screws. And then we use the um, hinge rod just to make it easier to, to facilitate. But again, I would encourage everybody in the uh, um, lab to look at all the different anatomy, uh, practice the screws as much as possible, and then uh, any questions, uh, feel free to ask the, uh, the faculty. So thank you. Really cool. Love the precision and brevity and clarity of your talk. Thank you. Question. Craniocervical junction, how do we determine intraoperatively how to dial in this highly deterministic uh, perfect angle for the craniocervical junction? Any guides, any angles? What do we do? Well, I've definitely made mistakes um, and I have had to correct them uh, in the past. I think one of the biggest things I did when I was younger as a, as a surgeon was sometimes do the military position too much and that can actually... Uh, lead to difficulty extubating and definitely difficulty with breathing and swallowing. So I've actually, uh, when I can, I get an intraoperative CT to assess how it looks 
overall. Um, I don't know if I have a specific angle. Jens, do you have a specific angle that you use? It's hard. I do look at the inferior end plate of C2 relative to the hard palate, and I try to get a lateral C arm shot for that. I also warn patients that if I don't like their craniocervical junction, I may take them back to the OR. I do think that the manufacturers have done a good job predetermining some of the angles uh, of their pre-contoured rods. I'm deeply suspicious of the articulated mm. uh, connectors. They're mechanically always weaker, and they do add an uh, error factor in there. Yeah. The general trend of most surgeons is to hyperflex the craniocervical junction and create an iatrogenic downward gaze, which is actually also quite disabling and may adversely affect the center of gravity yeah. pull down. So I don't know. For me, the key answer, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, is to avoid a craniocervical junction. And this was my favorite surgery for like 20 plus years to avoid a craniocervical junction by emphasizing a quality C1 fixation. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's true. I mean, I, when I first got to Cornell for a lot of the odontoid fractures, they were doing an ODA, OC fusion. And I discussed with them some of the restrictions that came with that. And we really have changed to, you know, obviously a better C1, C2 approach for most of those when it's unnecessary. Um, but I, I agree with you on that. I think, you know, sometimes it's just not possible, especially with the rheumatological cases, some of the uh, invaginations and some of the significant panaces out there sometimes precludes doing it. But it is possible sometimes if you get a good C1 purchase um, and uh, you to avoid it. Final question for you, um, Fusion. Again, uh, um, it's annoying when moderators and presenters agree on so much, but I love that you emphasize the Fusion and this implantation or implant-heavy uh, era. Um, what grafts do you suggest using? I see so many people just uh, smearing on some little whatever bone granules and unspeakable bone morphogenic whatever things. Yeah. Um, no names here, but... Um, Structural graft, um, what do you do to kind of get that biologic healing actually assured? You know, I, I won't say I have a great answer for that. A lot of my patients, I'm not sure long term, since I'm usually doing it in extremely elderly patients, I'm not sure, you know, how long you need to be able, to, how long they need to have that arthrodesis. But um, for the most part, I try to use either a structural allograft or I have um, kind of contained. Um, you know, they have products out there that are contained and shapeable, and I try to use those. I can't tell you if they're better or not, but, you know, I, that's how I, I approach it. But if you just put it in, sprinkle it in, it's going to not actually go across the junction. You'll probably get a good, you know, subaxial fusion, but you won't get the actual craniocervical junction to fuse. Yeah, and no, I think I agree with you. And individualizing that is a really good thing. And between the little lady who will benefit from a rib allograft that you can cable in uh, to a younger person, where a proper old uh, Bowman Wertheim time graft, which is a structural clothespin graft with iliac crest or something that uh, having the tools in armamentarium is, I think, as important as the hardware. Definitely. Thanks for being Thank here. You. Great talk. I just oh, sorry, to sorry. say something real quick. So I, I just can't emphasize the importance of having um, proper craniocervical alignment, especially for the ehler danlos population. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've had a patient who uh, had a fusion in South Carolina and she was like, I think only 16 or 17 and uh, ended up being fused in the extended position. So she, you know, when she would physiologically feel like her neck was, you know, relaxed, she'd have to stare up. So what ended up happening, she developed a distal uh, uh, pseudoarthrosis because she constantly was needing to flex her subaxial spine in order to see in front of her. And so, you know, it ended up being one of these situations where you treat the pseudoarthrosis, but also undo the craniocervical fusion, which she was young, so it was fused. You, you, you know, so so you had to, I had to like unlock it to try to get her head to you know bend forward and whatnot. So it it ends up being pretty tricky. So just very important to get it right from the beginning. And I like what Yen said. Just warn the patient that you may need a post-surgical adjustment like in the immediate post-operative period to get it perfect before they leave the hospital. In that patient, I did that. Like I, I took her back again 
um, to adjust the, you know, clavoaxial angle uh, in order to get it perfect. Do you think? Do you think a? Do you think a, a, a image, neuroimaging device or a three D device uh, would have helped you in your work? Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I, I wanted us to discuss, uh, Jens, you said you're trying to avoid going to the OC is. Are you using any, say for patients with basal invagination, cranial settling, are you using any distract, distraction me methods or implants to, to help you with that? So for basal vertebral uh, um, invaginations, uh, again, I get a CT scan. I must admit a high definition of one or two millimeter cut to study the integrity of C1. If the C1 lateral masses hold any hope for them, and if the vascular anatomy is suitable, I will distract C1 and C2 and put an interposition graft in to get the tip of the odontoid lined up with the upper end of the atlas. That actually works quite well. Uh, the C1, actually, even osteoporotic patients, is usually amazingly osteodense uh, for whatever. It's a membrane bone so it contains a far better uh, substance but again technique and bicortical screws without injuring the internal carotid artery anteriorly is critical for this uh, but you said it, basal vertebral invagination. Uh, this is a rheumatoid process or an inflammatory process usually. Uh, going to the occiput is cured for them. So yeah. this is one of those great decision-making points of uh, where and what to do. And probably that particular indication, I would still say, and occipital fusion is important. What Dr. Sanser said is so important. Those older patients especially, they finding that right balance is so important it's not necessarily angles because they want to have a downward gaze the more they have a myelopathy problem they will tend to want to lean forward so not hyperextending them uh, but not hyperflexing them just having it right where they are able to see the floor about one or two feet in front of their own tips of their toes is critical and it's a nuanced thing and i'm not uh, i would love to have better intraoperative imaging also uh, like what kai said but I mean, I guess one of the things, you know, I think discussing with like, it's a, it's a deformity surgery in the way that discussed before, you may not get it right the first time. Like if you go get a suit fitted, it sometimes takes them two or three times to fit it. So if you're on the table in a certain position, it may look great on the CT. And then maybe when they stand up or sit up, the angle that you thought they could achieve on the subaxial spine, as you discussed, is not adequate. So I think, you know, it is really important to discuss that you need to have a real life test as well. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank Kai. you.